Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maria Volpe and I'm part of the marketing team here at ILX Group. Welcome to our introduction to ITIL Practitioner webinar. Just a few housekeeping notes before we start the webinar. Feel free to ask questions during the webinar and our trainer will answer at the end of the session. You will receive the recording of the webinar today, but please stay until the end as we have a special offer for our webinar attendees. Follow us on our social media channels to keep updated on our upcoming events and here you will also find our previous webinars. At the end of the webinar, we will ask you to take a very quick survey. This will help us to improve our webinars and have your feedback and it will take only a couple of minutes. Now we'll hand it over to you, our IPL expert, Paul Wigdell. Paul, over to you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this session. Uh, my name is Paul Wigsell. Um, it's a pleasure to be speaking to you, speaking to you about the new practitioner course. So what we're going to talk about um, in the next 35, 40 minutes or so is um, how the practitioner book is structured, uh, what the book is all about, how the course ultimately um, that we have developed from that book at ILX will be structured, um, and then a little bit about the exam, uh, what to expect in relation to the exam, and um, who is this course designed for, who is it aimed at. So this, as you can see on the right hand side of the screen, is the uh, practitioner guidance book. Um, I have to say I've been involved for a long time with ITIL, been involved in authoring books um, and delivering and, and this is what um, Abid Ismail from um, Axelos will see and you probably already know this but when you see the word Axelos uh, just be aware that um, what we're actually talking about is capita because the government has passed on, uh, from the, the UK government rather, has passed on the uh, responsibility for managing what they refer to as the swirl products which are both uh, print to and ITIL through to Axelos, uh, but as I say, Axelos is um, effectively um, a, um, a looking for business unit, I suppose, um, of capita. But what um, Abid is saying is it's all about looking at continual service improvement, and, and very much this is uh, what this uh, practitioner is looking at. It's about looking at how we can make things better, but in truth, it's actually about making it physically better. So so it's actually about doing it, doing it for real. Uh, so we're going to talk about what's in the book, the in introduction of the guiding principles and the CSI approach. Uh, these are the chapters, but before we get into the book itself, I would just like to ask you guys a question. So Maria, if we could put up the first poll, please. What I'm actually going to ask you is, in relation to, to me making sure I, I hit, hopefully, the right uh, level for you guys. Um, could you just answer the question about how, where you are in relation to your ITIL training? So you should see this come up on your screen now. The question that says to you, oh, it says, excuse me, I just need to make that bigger so I can see it myself. Um, come on, machine. Yeah. Uh, what's your current level of qualification? So if you haven't done ITIL at all, then that's absolutely fine. I'd like to know that. If you're, you did ITIL many years ago, and we're talking about the, the, the foundation many years ago, I'd uh, like to know about that. If you're up to date with the foundation, if you're at an intermediate level, or even if I'm talking to experts, I just want to kind of gauge where you guys are so that we can um, appropriately pitch this presentation to you. Excellent. Oh, that's good. So we've got quite a good mix then. So we've got people who are um, very much up to speed. We've got some who have done it a few years ago and uh, quite a number that haven't actually touched ITIL at all. Okay, good. Thank you very much indeed then. So this is um, ITIL. Um, the ITIL practitioner we're going to be talking about. Um, let's just drop back and go back to it. So this is um, ITIL. Just to be fair, for those people who haven't done ITIL before, it used to stand for the IT Infrastructure Library. It no longer does stand for the IT Infrastructure Library because it's all about delivery of services. And that's one of the things that comes through time and time again in the book. These are the chapters of the book, as I said, but one of the things that comes through time and time again, and we'll see in the introduction slide in a second, is that this is about the delivery of services. This is about service management. 
gone are the days when IT service management was the big thing and everything was about IT, IT and IT. Let's be honest, every service in, in the whole world at the moment uses IT to enable to deliver its services. So the production or the delivery of IT services, whilst are very important, we must recognize that actually the delivery of services to the customers, to the stakeholders is ultimately what we're all about. So it's very much about um, the delivery of services, but we'll touch on that as we get through. The big thing, the big thing that I'm sure some of you have already seen down at the bottom there, and if I could get my pen to actually work properly, I'd be able to highlight it. There it is. Well done. Um, is that for the very, very first time, there are a whole raft of tools and templates within the book itself that real people, not consultants, real people can use in the real world uh, within your organization. So there's absolutely nothing at all stopping you guys uh, getting hold of the books, looking at the, uh, the toolkits, looking at the templates, and immediately being able to, to use them. Now, okay, we're, we're doing this presentation on behalf of ILX, so I would be stupid to say you wouldn't benefit more greatly in doing that if you have completed the practitioner uh, qualification and done the course already. However, there's nothing stopping you just doing it straight. But I would strongly suggest it's worth doing the course itself. But therefore, of course I would, that's why I'm here. So, the introduction, the book, it focuses on ITIL, it talks about ITIL, it mentions the fact and it talks about the fact that ITIL isn't a methodology, it's talking about the adapt and adopt, but as I've already mentioned, it's very, very focused on the fact that we should be service orientated and customer focused. It doesn't really talk about IT. It talks about the delivery of services. And you can see here down at the bottom here, where, or towards the bottom, where it's talking about delivery models, uh, the service integration and management. Um, it's talking about using the ITIL framework. And, and you'll notice uh, I've highlighted down there, finally, the recognition that ITIL is not just about IT, but it's about services and the delivery of services. It doesn't lose sight of the fact that it needs to define what the service is, what a customer is, what, a what the service provider is, the value, the outcome, the cost, and the risk. Everything that you guys who have done the um, foundation level would be very familiar with because that stands in the foundation course. You guys that haven't seen the, the foundation material, whilst I strongly advise that's worth doing, in, in essence what this is doing is defining what, what does service management see as a service, what does service management see as a customer, what does service management see as a user, and so on and so forth. It also has a very, very big emphasis upon value. From this practitioner point, it's very clear and says, if you are not delivering value, then what the heck are you doing it for? So part of the chapter, or sorry, not part of the chapter, it's wrong. Thing. One of the chapters is what's referred to as the guiding principles. Now, this is quite a, a curious chapter because in essence, it's fundamental to the whole of the delivery of the practitioner. And let's not f forget, the whole point of this practitioner course is about practically doing it. So it doesn't talk about processes, it doesn't talk about process diagrams and how you've got to remember process diagrams, it just talks about how you would actually do it. And it has a whole section, as I say, on these guiding principles that are interwoven throughout the rest of the book. And, and you see some of those, you can look at it, you can start, start thinking, well, that's really obvious, keep it simple, observe directly, but, and we'll work through these very quickly. But in essence, I just sits and says, if you are not delivering value, why on earth are you doing it? So if it's not delivering value to the customer or a stakeholder or the organization, why are you bothering to do it at all? And it just makes you draw a, a, a quick breath or take a stop and say, okay, so actually what we are doing, how is this delivering value? I, and, and I was talking to a, a chap a couple of days ago now, um, who had just come back from doing a course on process improvement and, and, and we were talking about the practitioner and about the practitioner book being all about this continual service improvement, this CSI, the continual improvement of services. And he was saying that as part of his course, they had looked at a process and then they, it was one of these gauge days, you may have done it yourself, where, where you have this game scenario where you're asked to do a very simple task and you're given um, a whole set of um, instructions of how to do the task. And he said, the first time we did the task, it took us about 11 minutes to complete the task. 
He said, then as slowly as we went through the day, we started to break down what we actually needed to do. Not what the instructions were telling us, but what we actually needed to do. And you started to find out that people were doing things just because the instructions said so, rather than because it delivered specific value. So he said, by the time we finished the day, we were doing the whole thing in 25 seconds. Not because we were cutting bits out, but because actually we'd focused on what was the value. And that's definitely what's in the book here about saying, is it really imperative? Is it delivering the value? And it links into this design for experience. Um, constantly looking at the customer base. We are, I think, as service providers, very guilty of saying, well, this is how it should work. This is the way it should be done. This is the way the customers are going to use it. This is what they should be doing. And not actually taking a step back and saying, but if I'm a customer, how would I want to interact with it? If I'm a customer, how would this do? And I and I and I am guilty of myself as an ITIL expert of saying, and I hand hold my hand up and say, as I know and learn more and more and more about delivery of services, I become worse and worse as a customer myself. Because I know how it should be being delivered. And when it's not being delivered that way, I get really, really irritated. Now I'm sure you as you're sitting there listening, can think of dozens of ex examples where you've had really poor, poor levels of service. From this, serv from this practitioner perspective, it's saying, let's constantly consider how the customer is going to interact here, how the customer is going to experience this. A most obvious thing is, start where you are. Part of the book says, don't, don't go away and rip it all up and start from scratch. You must be doing something quite well. Otherwise, you wouldn't have time to do the improvement. You rarely, in any organization these days, get to start with a completely blank sheet of paper. So let's try and resist the temptation to start from scratch. Let's actually start where you are. Let's work out what we're doing well. Now, for you guys who have done the foundation, you might be thinking, so you were talking about setting a baseline. Absolutely. But from a practitioner perspective, we're saying, let's understand what we do well, what we don't do so well. You could talk about it from a SWOT perspective, the, you know, the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities and threats. Or you could just simply say, hang on a minute, what does our company do well? Or what does our service provision area, or what does our IT area do well? And what do we need to improve? You'll notice here, these two kind of start to, to, to almost contradict each other, although they don't. Because it's saying, work holistically. No service or components stand alone. Strength is in the whole. Yes, of course it is. The more processes you put in, the more controls you put in, the more measurements you put in, the better and the stronger you will become. However, let's not try and do it all in one go. Because if you try and do it all in one go, you will inevitably fail. It's too big. So you can see the stupidity there, I put it there, don't try and eat the elephant all in one go. Work iteratively. Iteratively. If you haven't seen this word before, it's a really idle word. They love iterative cycles. It, it effectively means go around the loop. So look at it, uh, do it, check it, and then act accordingly. There's a Deming cycle called plan, do, check, act. And that's effectively the iterative bit that they're talking about. So from the practitioner perspective, it says, Think about it's got to, you know, it, it's got to interact with everything else. It's not standalone. We're not creating a silo. Strength is in actually interfacing and working with other processes or other areas of the service delivery. However, if we're trying to improve something, let's do a little bit at a time. Let's not do the whole thing in one go. Another one of the guiding principles is observe directly. To really know what's going on, go and see it. Go and watch it. Let's try and avoid assuming we know what people do. Uh, um, I, I was reminded of, of a, um, a TV program that keep, that's on a lot of, over here in the UK, isn't it, where we have things like Undercover Boss or um, Back to the Floor or Undercover the Boss Canada, um, un Undercover Boss USA or whatever it happens to be, where new chief execs get the job and the first thing they do is they go back and they go undercover because it makes good TV but they go undercover and try and experience what the people on the ground are actually experiencing and from a from a, an ITIL perspective that's exactly what they're saying you know observe it directly go back and see it let's not assume we know how the customers are interacting with our services let's actually Go and experience that. Let's go and see it. Now, you don't need to go and stand undercover and watch somebody doing that, but actually it might be by measurement, it might be by um, uh, customer surveys or whatever it happens to be. Let's truly understand what's going on. 
It might seem obvious, but then some of the best things are obvious. I just says be transparent. Let's not try from the practitioner perspective. Let's not try and hide hide what we're doing. Let's make people aware of what's happening. If we tell people what's happening and why it's happening, they are usually less obstructive. It does talk, and we'll get to it a bit later on. It does talk about resistance and how to deal with the resistance, but ultimately it's saying observe directly, understand what the customers are doing, but be transparent. Be transparent to your customer team. Be transparent to your your teams, your internal teams, be transparent to your staff, be transparent to your shareholders. What are you trying to do? Because hopefully they will then get on board with you. Which means that you actually find it far easier to collaborate. Get the right people in the right places. Get the better buy-in. Well, we can get better buy-in if we're transparent, if we're communicating better. And if we can get that buy-in and we are collaborating, then we have the likelihood of being far more successful as we progress. Rather than having champions, if you like, what we're actually doing is getting everybody involved. And then the last of the guiding principles might sound really stupid, but I bet we don't do it. I bet you guys that sitting at work don't do it. Sometimes doing it most simply is the best way. I know we've all been conscious of that saying, you know, oh yeah, it was a, it's the simple things that are the most successful. It's the simple things that make the money. Yes, it is. So from a, a service management perspective, let's not make it complicated. Let's not make it massively bureaucratic. Let's try and keep it simple. So if we're dealing with processes, if we're dealing with services, or even if we're dealing with the measurement, let's try and keep it simple. As a consultant, you go in and you talk to companies, and you frequently you'll start to say to people, so why are you measuring this? Why are you doing this? And they'll say to you, I don't know. I've just been asked to do it by my boss. But, but what's the point? What, what, what's the value you're getting back? Why are you doing it? What are you measuring? What's the purpose of what you're measuring? I don't know. So keeping it simple, being transparent, observing, and so on and so forth. So the guiding principles. Now, I'll just nip back because, interestingly, although we have these guiding principles, and you can see there are quite a few of them. There's nine of them in total. Um, there aren't any questions in the exam that are specifically about these guiding principles because, as I said right at the start, the guiding principles are interwoven throughout the practitioner. So whatever you're doing, whether you're um, implementing a new project, whether you're picking up a project from somebody else, whether you're imp implementing or improving a process, whether you're just looking at improving your teams, because don't forget this practitioner isn't just about process, isn't just about delivery of service, it's about teams as well, then actually focusing on the value, understanding where what the customers are getting from it, knowing where you are, working holistically, being pro, uh, being um, progressive in an iterative manner, being transparent, collaborating, keeping it simple, kind of that's the watchwords that should be happening all the time. So when you get questions in the exam, they're not specifically about that, they're inferred throughout the examination, and we'll get to the examination a bit later. So this is the CSI model. If you are a, an ITIL foundation holder, you will have seen this um, certainly if you're a 2011 foundation holder, you will have seen this. You guys who admitted that you did your foundation prior to 2011, depending on when you did it, you might have seen this. If you did it um, when it was version 3, which is 2007 onward, you would have seen it. If you did it prior to 2007, uh, you wouldn't have seen it because it wouldn't have been there. Um, I like this. I like this a lot. Um, I, I'm slightly biased because I know the guy who created it, but I, I do think it's very, very successful. Um, and I have certainly used it in the real world myself. I don't know whether you guys have, so what I'm going to do is ask Maria, if you could possibly put up the second question, please, just out of um, pure curiosity, and I appreciate you guys who have not done it or might not have done this, but could you just answer this question? Have you ever used this continual service improvement approach for real? Have you actually done it? Okay, interesting. So some of you have. Oh, I'm just. Oh, yeah. So 13% of you have done. 13% uh, of you say yes, and the remi remainder say no. Okay, fair enough. Thank you very much indeed. I would ad advise, if you can, um, once you've done the the um, practitioner course, I think you'd be very keen to to use it. It's I find it very very useful myself. Just in in very very brief terms. 
I would say this is a chapter in the book. It's the, the pivot point in the book, if you like, because bear in mind that the ITIL practitioner is about doing things. It's about getting things better. It recognizes that you're never starting with a blank sheet of paper. Therefore, whatever organization you're in, you are going to be trying to improve what you've got already. So ITIL works in a very simple, simple premise. What's the vision? And certainly as part of the book, it goes through and it talks about the vision and it talks about saying you need to understand what the business vision is, what the mission is. There's no point in coming up with improvement opportunities to expand if a company is looking to contract. There's no point in coming up with improvement opportunities to save money if the company is looking to expand. So we need to understand the vision. We need to understand the mission. You can't begin any improvement journey if you don't know where you're starting from. In fact, bottom line is you can't conclude any journey, you can't complete any journey, you can't even start any journey if you don't know where you are. So we take a baseline and say, okay, so at least we have a defined point where we know where we are starting from. And then the next obvious option is to say, well, okay, so where are we trying to get to? What's our target? And we need to set our measurable targets, and now you can have smart targets or whatever it happens to be that suits you. And this is all defined in the book, We're talking about this in the book. And then the bit, that how do we get there? Now, you guys who have done the service, uh, done the foundation um, for service management will remember, I'm sure, the seven-step improvement process. For information, the seven-step improvement process, and those of you who haven't done it, don't stress about it, is not in the book. How do we get there is about looking at what you're doing and saying, how can we make these better and how can we deliver to our targets? So if you're doing it from a pure ITIL perspective, you might look at the seven step, but actually from this practitioner perspective, it doesn't focus upon that. It just says, okay, let's consider service improvement. Let's consider process improvement. What are you trying to achieve? Let's talk about improvement generically and how you're gonna go about um, implementing that. And then finally, the bit that there is a chapter on a bit later on in the book called Metrics and Measurements, we need to know, did we actually arrive at that point? If you have set yourself a target, then we need to be able to say, did we actually make it? And from an ITIL perspective, we then do it all over again, providing we are still in line with the vision, because this is about an iterative improvement. And the book breaks that down, and we talk about that in the book, and there are lots of questions around that in the real exam as there are around measurement. Now, I would say that for the very, very first time in a very long time, ITIL starts to be clear about what a CSF is and a KPI is, but we'll talk about that in a moment. It talks about hierarchies. It talks about the measurement cascade. Again, you'll see that in a second. It talks about the categories around metrics. It talks about assessments, reporting. That's linked into measurement. But let's, so, so let's, let's talk about that. Let's get there. ITIL has forever said, why are you bothering to measure? There's only really four reasons to measure, to validate what you have decided upon, to direct where you're intending to go, to justify the decisions that you have made, and if something is wrong, to intervene to start to put it right. And it totally supports that. And one of the key messages that comes out of a practitioner book is, understand what you're measuring and why you're measuring. As I say, for the very, very first time, for a long time in the ITIL books, it actually starts to break out what a critical success factor actually is and what a key performance indicator is. I have to say, as an ITIL practitioner myself or as an ITIL expert that travels the world, this is the area where most organizations make most mistakes. They still think that key performance indicators are critical success factors. And part of this book is to actually make very clear that there is a measurement that, uh, sorry, that there is a link between the vision of the organization, the objectives of the organization and the goals, uh, and then cr what's critical to the success of those uh, objectives or goals, what are the key performance indicators that show you achieving your critical success factors, what are the metrics and the measurements that sit below the key performance indicator that actually show you you are achieving those. So it's nice, and there's a nice clear um, example, and uh, not example is the wrong word, nice clear explanation of what each of those are. As well as the old faithfuls about um, you should be measuring for te against technology, against services, um, and against processes. But you'll notice there it says, for the very first time, ITIL starts to actually draw out and starts talking about things like leading and trailing metrics. So metrics that are leading you towards making a decision. 
metrics that are looking retro so effectively leading is about looking um, predicting looking ahead to the future the words gone straight out of my, my mind whereas training metrics are retrospective proactive sorry so leading metrics are proactively looking ahead trailing metrics are retrospectively looking backwards and remembering that we have this continual focus on the customer and the customer value they also talk about outside in metrics and inside out metrics so metrics that come from the outside looking inwards and metrics that are from the inside looking outwards so there's nice clear explanations about they those and and again going back to our um, section seven or our chapter seven tools and templates to say okay this is a critical success factor what is the key performance indicator that links to this critical success factor and what are the metrics that sit below the key performance indicator that will actually deliver that so it gives you the tool to enable you to very clearly define a critical success factor and work out what measurements are needed to deliver the metrics to deliver the key performance indicator that shows you whether you've achieved that and also there are tools and examples um, in relation to assessments and reports again you don't have to use them this is a ITIL it's all about adapt and adopt but if you wanted to they're there you'll notice it's talking here about the measurement uh, as well as internal stuff it's about linking the fact that um, everybody understands where the measurement and what the measurement is this is about the transparency and understanding why we're measuring and you can see that the, the organization links to the business units and the business units links down to the departments and departments to the teams and teams to the people and of course there's a, a flow backwards as well because the output of the, the people and the team feeds into the teams and the department the outputs of the departments and the team and so on and so forth so we understand that there is a flow we're not just measuring for the sake of measuring that there's a clear understanding of why we're measuring and what we're measuring and there's practical advice and guidance within the book to help you achieve that it also focuses upon communication communication principles now we all know that communication is absolutely imperative for all areas of the organization these days and the new practitioner book really drums home about this this is the one area of all of the book where people find it most easy to absorb when we've done tests and stuff like that this is the area that everyone really really gets comfortable about but it talks about things like uh, we need to communicate between our customers and our service providers in you know both ways uh, we are all communicating all of the time it doesn't matter whether we're doing it via email or whether we're doing it by body language or whether we're doing it by webinars or whatever it happens to be uh, we're all communicating all of the time and we need to recognize that we need to recognize that timing and frequency in communication matters so there's no point in telling people after the event that it's happened there's no point in telling people three minutes before the event occurs we need to give it the right time we need to give it the right gravitas we need to give it the right type of communication and it recognizes that no single method of communication works within any organization within any team we have to be um, creative with our identif identifying or identification of what communication methods would be most appropriate so it talks about in section 7 a communication strategy it talks about having a communication plan it talks about a communication map and they're there for you to use those tools are there for you to use if you want to and it's understanding whether you're going to do it via webinar, whether you're going to do it by video, whether you're going to do it by a video link, as it were, whether you're doing it by virtual conference or emails or town hall meetings or whatever it happens to be. There's a large amount of stuff around communication. As indeed there is about this last bit here, the organizational change management. Now, ITIL has forever talked about change management and talked about processes for changing things, and it's talked about changing the uh, technical aspects if you have thought about doing the intermediate RCV course you would then move on to things like organizational change management and you would focus on what's down here called JP Cotter's eight steps to transformational change now when we're talking about organizational change management it's talking about the people and how the people deal with change it always makes me laugh that the one thing that humanity is absolutely appalling at is dealing with change but the one thing that humanity constantly try strives for is to change so we are constantly changing we're constantly adapting even though that's the one thing that we're really really poor at 
So JP Cotter is an American guy, talked about um, eight steps of transformational change. You don't need to know it all, but it's talking about forming a guiding coalition, uh, creating a vision, communicating the vision, empowering people to get involved, creating quick wins, turning those quick wins into more kind of medium, long-term wins until ultimately the exception of ch uh, or change becomes a cultural acceptance, with, uh, becomes culturally accepted rather within the organization. But it is about understanding people through change. People don't like change and we need to recognize that. So it, we talk about things like the emotional curve and the emotional responses. We talk about things like resistance in, in this practitioner book and the fact that there is resistance to change constantly. And you can see there that, that there are templates within section seven for identifying those who are going to be most resistant or those who are going to be least resistant and then coming up with a plan to communicate with those, to provide the transparency to get them on side, to collaborate with those people. So it talks about the difference between a bog standard, ITIL change management, and the organizational change management. It talks about uh, RACI. Those of you who have done ITIL know that that stands for responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed. Those of you who haven't, there it is. Who is responsible? Who is accountable? Who needs to be consulted? Who needs to be informed? Who is the right person to lead? And who are the right person to be in, people rather to be involved? So we're thinking about change management uh, from, a, from almost from a social and from a people perspective, not about the activity of change management as you would find in in bog standard, as I say, ITIL change management. So those are the six chapters. Very very quick, but I appreciate you're going to get this as a, um, uh, a recording. So if you wanted to go back and listen to me again. Uh, by all means do. The big bit, and the bit that most people are excited about, and myself included, is the toolkit. We've had this, and this is uh, going to put lots of consultancies' nose out a little bit, because effectively this is what consultants used to bring into your work. But now you can do it yourselves. So we have a template for the CSI register and for benefits realization. We have a tempo, template for the CSFs and the KPIs as I've talked about. We have a communications checklist. We have a, a communication success. We talked about the resistance management chat, plan. We talked about making sure that the KPIs are balanced and that we're not just focusing on um, uh, the technology, but we're actually focusing on, and you, you may remember that when you start talking about things like quantitative uh, KPIs and qualitative KPIs. Uh, it talks about things like uh, communications with your stakeholders. It talks about even as basic stuff like uh, taking notes in a meeting and why you would go about doing that. And it even draws out into things like the business case and the importance of a business case and what you would expect to see within a business case. So maybe there's a tick list there for your business, uh, for, for anyone who's creating one. So it's a real I think, a, a fantastically valuable resource for anybody who's looking to do any sort of improvement within their organization. So just very briefly looking at those and, and appreciating you, you don't know uh, much about what's in there uh, until you've actually done the course, I would just be curious as to have, when you, when you see that, um, are there anything that, is there anything there that jumps out at you and you think, ooh, well, that might be quite useful for me at the moment. So, Marie, if you could possibly put up the, the poll question three. And I'd just be interested, when you look at that, um, did you see, is there anything in there that you made you think, oh, that's quite interesting. I would definitely be using that, or possibly I'd like to use that. Or do you look at that and think, no, that's not for us, that's not relevant to us at all. Okay, good, good. Um, I think that's that's likely too. I think possibly, de I think possibly definitely. Um, I think the definites are. I'm very comfortable with that. Uh, and the possibles, I think you, when you look at it on after you've completed the course, you would definitely go back and say, do you know what? I would really, really use that. I can see the value of that now. So let's talk about the course very briefly. It's uh, trying to find the right button. Excuse me. Yeah. Okay. So. The course itself, it's two days in length. Well, that's not strictly true. It's actually a day and a half in length because whilst it is two days in length, we will be doing the exam at the end of the second day. 
Now, just for your information, because we haven't got to the exam bit yet, but the exam is an hour and three quarters long. So you're losing probably the best part of two, two and a half hours of the day to doing the exam. So if you assume that we are aiming to finish at 4.30, 5 o'clock, let's be generous and say 4.30, that means that the real exam needs to start by about 2.15, 2.30 at the latest, or the preparation for the exam. So effectively, your course is a day and a half. There's a lot of stuff to get through in a day and a half. If you have done the PRINT2 course, you know how much stuff goes into the, the PRINT2 practitioner course. This new ITIL, found, uh, new ITIL practitioner course is not that dissimilar in the amount of stuff that needs to be picked up. So, most likely, and most of the training providers that I'm aware of are bolting it onto the end of the foundation course. Now that doesn't mean that most people that will take the foundation will then automatically go on to the practitioner. In fact, quite the reverse. I would expect most people to start with to do the foundation, give it a couple of weeks and then do the practitioner. Or potentially, if you've already got the foundation, then come in and just do the straight practitioner. It's not one that relies upon the other specifically, but I'll explain what I mean a bit later. So the foundation course runs potentially Monday to Wednesday, and then the practitioner will be the Thursday to Friday. As I say, it's two days in length. It's a lot to learn. So this isn't one of those that you're going to come up and rock, rock home at lunchtime. This will take the entire lot of two days. But the big bit is it's purely focused on the practical application, and therefore the course is practically driven because it's about doing it. It's not about the, the theory. It's not about just educating people in processes, it's about educating people to actually be able to do it. So when we put the ILX course together, we put it together to make it nice and flexible. So if it's a public course, um, then we will use a fictitious company for all of the practical exercises. So we've written a, uh, a fictional company, we have a scenario. That will become very clear and very important in a moment. But there is a scenario. And we'll use that scenario for the practical exercises. And then people can take those uh, ideas away and use them in their real, uh, real world. If, for example, any of you who are sitting on this um, think that you might be interested in running a private course at your event, at your organization, so we have 12, 15, 16, or whatever it is of your people on that course, then actually we can get away with a fictitious, or we can lose the fictitious company scenario, and we can actually do all of the practical exercises around your organization. So effectively, you almost get like a, a day and a half, two day workshop slash consultancy um, activity going on. The course itself does use, and it focuses upon the book. And that's a big deal because for the very, very first time ever in an idle world, the exam is open book. So the same rules apply as they do for the foundation course. You can tab it, you can write in it, you just can't stick loose leaf sheets in it or post-it notes or stickies or whatever you want to call them. So we will very much focus upon the book, but it's all about being practically based. So it's about doing. So the course is a little bit, very little bit of slide stuff but this is not one of those courses where you are going to have you know, two days of somebody standing in front of you talking to you and showing you slides. It's about, okay, here's 10 minutes of slides, let's do 45 minutes of actually doing it. Here's another 10 minutes of slides, okay, let's spend the next hour doing that. Okay, now we've talked about that. If you were putting slides together at this point, what sort of things would you be expected to see? Okay, well, let's look at these three minutes. Look, you were right, you were right, you were right. Right, let's do another exercise. But the exam itself, as I've already said, it's an hour and 45 minutes long. That's a long time. Now, I have to say, truthfully, hand on heart, when I did the exam myself a few weeks ago, even as an ITIL expert, it took me an hour and 35 minutes. So it will take that full length of time. It is not an easy exam by any means. There are 40 multiple choice questions. And they are all based on a scenario. Now, the scenario that the exam board have given you is one all about driverless cars. 
Um, it's very different to any of the other idle scenario based questions because usually you would have a scenario and then you have a question, a scenario and a question. In this examination, what you actually have is a generic scenario, a couple of sheets of paper telling you what's going on in the organization. And then you have additional elements to the scenario. And you will see that on the exam itself and on the scenario paper, it said, says, for questions one to 10, there is the extra bit and the scenario to read. For questions 11 to 15, please read the second bit of the scenario. For questions 16 to 28, please read the third bit of the scenario. So you are building up additional questions around the scenario, but it is built around the scenario because it's about being practical and it's about doing it. And that's what actually makes the exam really difficult because it isn't theoretical. It's about what would you actually do? The good news is that there is at the moment one sample paper. There is a second one due to come out very shortly. But the sample paper uses exactly the same scenario as the real exam. So once we learn that, or once you learn that, then actually it makes life a lot easier. The hard bit is that it's going to take 28 to pass. So you've got to get 28 out of 40. Now, that gives a 70% pass rate. This may change. Because any of you who have done the PRINCE2 course knows that actually the PRINCE2 course is only 55% uh, to pass. So they might reduce the pass rate, but I think they would then increase the difficulty of the questions. So my advice to anybody doing this, and I've, I've spoken to a lot of people that are interested in doing the practitioner course, is do it soon. Certainly my experience is the early adopters of the ITIL qualifications have got the best papers because after a while they start to get harder and harder and harder. Now that's not to say they're easy at the moment because they're not, they're difficult, but get in early, be, a, be one of the first, first to get it uh, and then all things start to, to get a bit easier. The exam itself is the end of the second day as we've already touched. So what should an attendee expect if they're coming to the course? Well, they should expect one and a half days of good, solid, hard learning, but it is going to be really beneficial to take into the real world environment. There will be a few hours of evening in the home, uh, so a few hours of evening homework. If you don't do the homework, there's not a chance you're going to get through the exam. Now, in truth, the homework at the moment is just about going back through the papers, so back through the the, the um, courseware that we've done through the day, because you don't get a chance to go back through it and look at it in the second day. When the second sample paper comes out, there will almost all, almost certainly be additional questions to do in the evening as well, just to add to that learning. You do get the actual practitioner book that, of course, you can annotate and write over and tab and all that sort of stuff. The bit is, the biggest bit is that this is, for the very first time in the art of world, a very interactive, very practically based delivery. Even you guys who did version two of ITIL and talked about doing the practice, uh, they, they called them practitioner courses in those days. This practitioner, this practitioner um, qualification is far more practically based than even they were. It is a tricky exam. Uh, my suggestion is it's going to get harder. It's not going to get easier. But you do get a huge amount of opportunity to ask questions of the consultant or the trainer doing the training. And obviously, the big thing is that this opportunity gives, uh, sorry, the opportunity you get from doing this course uh, delivers a lifelong effective skill set. Because bear in mind, this is not about IT. It doesn't matter what area you work in, you are going to be asked to continually improve what you're doing. And having these skills, having these tools massively, make, or makes that massively easier. So who's the course actually for? Well, ultimately, it's for those who want to do something practical and not people who are managing necessarily. If you are a manager, there's no reason why you can't do it. But actually, if you've got team members who you want to get involved in ITIL or have done the foundation, but you don't want them to go and learn how to implement a process, then this is the course for them. It's about actually doing it. So if they're not interested in achieving the expert status as yet, this is the, this is the course to put people on. It's for people who are looking to um, improve what they have, not start from nothing. It's for those people who are looking to improve or implement from nothing where they know they have some resistance. And it's for those people who have the foundation and want to improve their ITIL knowledge but don't particularly want to do a whole course on strategy or a whole course on transition or a whole course on um, operation or a whole course on design but actually 
want to have another ground as have another general grounding of how ITIL works but doing it from a practically biased perspective or practical perspective rather than being all about the theory of how service management works so that's who it's for so from my perspective that's that's it that's that's as much as I can tell you the book I think is I should say right at the start probably um, a breath of fresh air when all is said and done when we we you may or may not criticize uh, the Axelos control I hope not because I think they have done some really positive things and this is the first of the really positive things you'll see coming through this is without doubt one of the best books from uh, the ITIL stable for a very very long time and the course that goes around it is a really good involved innovative and exciting course to actually do because as I say first time you get to actually do stuff so thank you very much indeed. Thank you for listening to me preach at you. I, I am fairly passionate about the practitioner stuff because I think it's a really, really big step forward. But thank you very much indeed. Now, I do understand that Ben is going to talk to you. Ben's obviously one of our sales guys. Ben's going to talk to you about an opportunity or a couple of opportunities that we have uh, from ILX. Ben, it's over to you, sir. Paul, thank you very much. Uh, very informative uh, presentation. And uh, I have to say I've learned a couple of things myself, so even better. Um, so I was just going to talk everyone through. As Paul um, insinuated, I was I am one of the uh, salespeople here in the London team, um, and I'm just going to talk you through uh, a few of the products and offers that we have on uh, available for you this afternoon as well. Um, so for the ITIL Foundation, the e-learning course without an exam, um, that's for 315 pounds in the exam is 150 pounds just after that as well. Um, you can see a few different details around the different options we have uh, for the ITIL Foundation. So there's a classroom course there, which is £655 in various locations around the UK. Uh, we have the ITIL Practitioner course, which has been obviously the uh, kind of centre of attention this afternoon. That's the classroom course for £935, which is the two days and the exam that Paul was talking about, as well as the manual. We've got a blended option as well, so you can do the foundation and the practitioner. Now this is actually the, uh, the foundation level online with a 12 month online license, plus then the practitioner, so you get the two days uh, sitting in the classroom understanding exactly how to put that to practice, and the exam and the manual for £1,295. There should be one more slide if we can click onto that as well. Now, for the offer for this exclusive webinar offer. Um, so if you're ITIL Foundation qualified, you can actually book your ITIL Practitioner course and we'll give you a 15% discount. Uh, this is valid until Tuesday the 5th of April. If you're not ITIL Foundation qualified, don't worry, we've still got an offer for you as well, which is the ITIL Practitioner course. If you book that before the 5th of April, we'll give you the ITIL Foundation e-learning free of price. So there's a few different ways that you can get onto this. Um, so you can either go onto our website, which is ilxgroup.com, and there's a promo code just below there. Uh, you can give us a call on our Nantwich office number, which is 0201270611600. And then there's also a couple of email addresses if you'd like to get a bit more information first, which is the individuals. So anyone that would like to buy it for themselves, you can email my colleague Nadia. So that's Nadia Yahia at ilxgroup.com. And if anyone's looking for their organization, or if anyone has kind of a group over about three, four, five people, um, then if you want to drop me a line, um, that's ben.green at ilxgroup.com. Um, just before I sign off, we've got one question in. Can this ITIL Foundation e-learning course be done from a European country, i.e. Germany? Yes, it definitely can. Um, you can also take, you can take the full Foundation e-learning course from anywhere in the world that has an internet connection. Um, and you can also do the exam from Germany as well as an online exam. So. I'm going to hand back over to Paul. Um, however, I think we're going to see if there's any questions, and, uh, and I'll hand back over to him as well. Thank you, Ben. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you very much indeed for that, Ben. Right, Maria's going to be...
our, our um, umpire and referee and um, good good all-round administration person. So if anybody has any questions other than that one about uh, whether you can do the e-learning from Germany or anywhere in Europe, then please could you uh, post it in the chat box right now and then Maria will pick it up and pass it on to myself. Um, if not, then that's absolutely fine, no problem at all. Thank you very much indeed for listening, but this is your opportunity, should you wish to, to ask any questions you wish. Any questions, anybody? Okay, well, thank you very much indeed for attending then, and uh, I hope very, very shortly that we'll see you in a classroom to talk to you about the ITIL practitioner uh, and how you can actually make service management better in your organization. Thank you very much indeed for your attendance. Um, and Maria, I shall hand, oh, Okay, um, I can just see that. Yeah, very quick. Sorry, quick question there. I can see. Thank you very much indeed for asking that. Could you explain briefly how the practitioner course fits into the ITIL expert framework, credits, etc.? A very, very good question. Uh, and this is why it's really good to get in quick. Uh, the answer to that question is it's actually being awarded. For you guys who don't know how this works, um, you get two credits for having um, a foundation certificate. If you go into the intermediate life cycle courses, you get three per course. If you do the capability quest, uh, courses, you get four per course, and you need to build up to seven in order to be able to do the managing cost of life cycle. Uh, sorry, seventeen. So seventeen, uh, in able to, to be able to get to managing cost of life cycle to become an ITIL expert. Um, the answer to that question, and thank you for it, is that this practitioner qualification is worth three credits. So it's equivalent to a life cycle course. Now, personally, I think that's a very dangerous thing to have done because it does mean that potentially people can get to managing across the life cycle having not done the entire life cycle of courses. But that's where it stands at the moment. Is it, question, is it better to take before life cycle or capability pathways? Um, No, in, in all honesty, I don't think it's going to make any difference. I, I think you can do the practitioner course, it stands alone, and you can do the practitioner course whenever you see it's work more useful to you. Um, in essence, would it help the capability? Yes. Uh, would it help the life cycle? No, because the life cycle is much more theoretical than the capability. The capability is much more practically based, um, but it, it truly does stand out on its own. So uh, I would say it wouldn't be better um, it would certainly not deter or, or be detrimental to taking the life cycle or capability pathway. So you could do it before, you could do it during, you could do it after. It would be of the same value to you, I believe. But thank you for the question. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Maria, are you there, madam? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Well, um, I, I think it's only right and proper that you should potentially say uh, goodbye to everybody as you said hello to everybody. Yes, thank you very much for your attention. You will receive the recording of the webinar today. And that's all from us. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.